Hello Booktube! I want to try something a little different uh, for this video. I don't want it said that this channel is becoming predictable. <laughs> uh, so what I thought I'd do is a bookend video to one that I made yesterday. Yesterday I got a two-book mail haul. Uh, one was a debut novel and one was an elaborate new edition of the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and because of the vagaries of my reading schedule, just because of the publication dates of the books and whatnot, I was able to just go ahead and read both of those things last night. Uh, and so I want to make a video talking about them. Instead of maybe mentioning them or maybe not on some wrap-up down the line, I thought I would tell you about each one of them uh, now, immediately after having read them. <laughs> uh, and the first one is this. It's Orphans of Liberty uh, by Nathan K-N-A-P-P. -P. Uh, and it's his debut novel. It's self-published. It's set in a, a, a vaguely, lightly dystopian America. It's America that's there are there is no new technology. There are no aliens have invaded or anything like that. This is it's set just a few steps down the road from present day news stories. So there's nothing here that that uh, there's no world building aside from society building because the uh, the society that the author envisions here is an America in which there wa there has been a recent drastic uptick in incidents of lone wolf terrorism on American soil, terrorists who kill and bomb and whatnot, but who do so uh, for ideological reasons and chaotic reasons rather than state-sponsored reasons. Uh, and in response to that drastic increase in, increase in violence on its in the streets and its shopping malls and whatnot, uh, the United States Senate and, uh, it turns out, a group of powerful power brokers in that Senate have uh, they passed a law, Defense of Liberty Act, that uh, that has created uh, both a program, uh, which is designed to root out this this terrorism and also trample on civil rights in the process, uh, and a list, both with a capital letters. The list is a list of those lone wolf terrorists that is that is published. It's well known, and uh, you don't want to get on that list. <laughs> Because then you're just going to be hunted down. And there's a price on the, the heads of everyone on that list. And because there's now a program and a list, and because the American people seem okay with it, there has arisen a class of people, of bounty hunters, whose identities are well known. They are quasi-celebrities on the news shows and in pop culture, who, who hunt these the people down on the list. They they hunt them down, bring them in dead or alive, they're... they're uh, uh, action heroes in a nihilistic kind of way. And one of the best of them all is our hero, Omar Mohammed Issa, who is uh, kind of a lone wolf on his own. He, he, his wife and child were killed in a, in a drone bombing uh, years ago, and it's left him bitter and alone. He doesn't, he doesn't experience, we don't see him experience any of the kind of high school jock camaraderie of other bounty hunters. He doesn't seem to like them, they don't seem to like him, but he's really efficient. Uh, the opening scene of the book is him taking down someone on the list, so we get a sense of what his job is like. Uh, and <laughs> there are dissidents, of course. There are all sorts of, uh, of hacktivist groups, anonymous hacktivist groups, and one of them is called the Orphans of Liberty. Uh, Issa pays them no mind one way or another. They don't really interfere with his life, which is to uh, assemble all the information that he can on any member of uh, any person who's on the list, and then hunt them down. Uses instincts and all of technology. That in this new America, government-sponsored drones are routinely patrolling everywhere. They especially patrol all roads. There's a government-sponsored uh, AI called Shirley that uh, helps with navigation. Yes, but also watches everything. Uh, and uh, Omar has gotten very good over the time that he's been a bounty hunter and co in coalescing all of that plus his own hunter instincts. Uh, and it's made him one of the most successful bounty hunters uh, out there, especially a solo bounty hunter. Uh, he's, he's just, it's, as this book begins, he's just broken into the top 20. Uh, it, at one point, a hapless person suggests that maybe he could get an autograph. <laughs> Omar has no patience for anything like that. He is not a happy person. As this book begins, and yet, scattered throughout this book, are uh, incidents and vignettes of actual of uh, puckish humor. There, this is not a humor. You might look at it, and you might hear that synopsis, and think this is a completely humorless book, and it's not. 
Uh, there are there are some there are some funny bits in here. Books, the bits that will make you smile, and one scene in particular involving drunken college students that will make you laugh out loud. Uh, and uh, as the book begins, Omar is I mean he's joyless. He's a killer. He's he has a certain amount of renown. He has money in the bank. Uh, he has a certain regularity to his life. But his wife and daughter are dead, and he uh, has not been the same person. It's a, the classic you know gimmick of action adventure stories like this one, which is that the main hero has ha has lost part of his soul because his family was killed. Um, when early on in the book, th through means and for reasons that become clear in time, Omar realizes that he is now on the list. Maybe it was a setup. Maybe he was a little too good at what he was doing. Maybe he cheesed off the wrong person, but one way or another. One day he, he wakes up and he realizes he himself is being hunted. Now he, on a personal level, is tremendously more dangerous than most of the other bounty hunters who have been tasked with taking him in. But there are plenty more of them than there are of him. So he goes on the run. Uh, and uh, the author takes it from there. It becomes a, a good guy on the run novel. We've, we've seen those many, many times. I, I've seen them. I, I love that kind of book. Uh, where all of a sudden, all of the, technolo the technological advances that helped him to hunt down members of the list, Lone Wolf Terrace, is now working against him. He, as, as he mentions a couple of times in the book, he now has to pray for cloudy days because they hamper drone activity, which might, which might track him or you know even bomb him from the skies. He has to, he has to think that way. Uh, uh, maybe a, a conscious echo on the author's part that an uncomfortable side effect of American foreign policy, which is that children all over the, all, all over huge parts of the world also now reflexively think that a sunny sky is a dangerous sky because of drones. Uh, drones are all through this book. There's also lots of other stuff too, but, uh, but the author never extrapolates on present day technology to the point where you, where it gets in the way of the story. There's never a point where you think, Oh, what's that? Or, Oh, no, that's wrong. That shouldn't be. There are a couple of slip ups here and there where the author, uses terminology that is going to be dated <laughs> very much dated and that dates him and in terms of where he got a lot of his cultural imprinting <laughs> uh, and also there's a, there is a parade of big marquee retail chains uh that that you know so they're just the way we've seen history go in the last 10 years half of them won't be around when this story is allegedly taking place uh but in the course of the novel Omar not only gain, gets help from bar, various dissident, dissident groups, including the Orphans of Liberty, but he also starts to learn a lot more about both the program and the list. Uh, things that uh, are genuine revelations. It's not like he digs deep into them and sees more of the same or what he expected. And uh, it's all done really well. Uh, this is this is a, an, an action, a slightly futuristic action adventure novel with a, lo a strong layer of. Uh, topical political themes running throughout it that, that not not uh heavy-handed not browbeating you will not feel lectured to one way or another but it will make you think uh, it'll make you think about the direction that our own society is taking but that is never the main point the main point is four square uh action hero adventure and also pathos because we don't just want omar to live we also you know by the by the first third of the book we also want him to heal uh, the author has uh, has made the what I consider to be the very wise decision to give this book virtually no breathing room. You don't, you hardly ever have time to take a breath. It's action sequence after action sequence. He's made a point, I think, of twisting the narrative any at any point where it might relax <laughs> and slow down a little, and that works really well. Uh, the the action sequences are really well done. The the uh, political, the social political, slightly dystopian stuff that he has invented for this novel, he has also thought about. So the the real world ramifications of it don't feel tacked on. It feels all very baked in uh, to the book itself. Uh, so I can actually, I'm, I'm uh, sorry if I'm sounding a little amazed. I read a lot of debut novels and I read a lot of self published stuff for Kirkus Reviews. And 
barely any of it is this good. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I won't name any names. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but I read a huge amount of stuff like this, mostly for Kirkus, and most of it is just between us, errant garbage. <laughs> this was clearly industriously worked over. Uh, care was put into almost every aspect of it. I really appreciate that. This is, I don't know, the problem with, with books like this is that the world hasn't caught up with the self-publishing industry. So stuff like this is being made. That I can picture this pleasing an audience of tens of thousands. Uh, anybody who likes Stephen Hunter, for instance, would love this, would gobble it right up. And I don't see them ever knowing about it. I mean, the, the, those channels seem weirdly distracted or blocked or non-existent. How, how does anybody at the aforementioned Barnes & Noble ever find out about this book? The author can't email each one of them and mail them a copy of his book. Uh, so I don't, I don't know quite what the answer to that is, but I can strongly recommend this book. If you go, I'm sure that, that, that it's on, you know, Amazon or wherever you would go to get this book, and you have, I don't know, I don't even know what it costs. Isn't that terrible? These these pa these papers in it are not its pub sheet. It came to me without a pub sheet. I have no idea what the details of this are. It's probably less than ten dollars. Uh, but one way or another, if you're in the mood for this kind of thing, download the ebook or buy the book because you will enjoy it. Uh, it's competently done, and then, of course, it's a first novel, so I don't want to oversell it. They're, you're all very experienced readers, and you'll know what to think. You'll know what to expect with a debut novel. And it happens here. There's great. Uh, there's a great deal of consistent overwriting. Omar enters the scene, and we learn more about that scene, more about the people in it. We are told more of the stuff that, as you know, Bill paying, walking around outside adults, we don't need to be told. Uh, First-time authors, that's one of the hardest things for them to let go of is the, the the feeling that they need to hold the reader by the hand. They don't. <laughs> they absolutely don't, especially in a thriller. Oh my God, because that sort of stuff slows, slows things down and you don't ever want to do that. This author clearly wants his narrative to keep popping. He's constantly twisting and, and you know, juicing it so that it doesn't ever stop. But uh, a, a first time novelist habit like that threatens to bog things down on a number of different occasions. Uh, <laughs> then the future books, I would hope that the author would would uh, finish his manuscript like this, and then just ruthlessly prune, <laughs> just ruthlessly prune. Don't don't tell your audience what they can infer, and don't underestimate what they can infer because they can infer a lot. It'll it not only and you might think if you did that you, you'll be left with you know too few pages, but taking all that padding out leaves you with a lot of room for better stuff for. Uh, leaner, more evocative stuff that you can then put in. Um, and uh, I mentioned I mentioned the, the datedness. There's, there's some of that here, too. The, another first-time novelist foible that they often exhibit is that they don't ruthlessly police their manuscript for idiom. And I don't just mean linguistic idiom. I also mean cultural idioms where, you know, if, like, for instance, a, a debut novelist of an earlier generation might have said, I had a character make a quip about better living through chemistry, and not even think where that phrase comes from, or the fact that, that their readers who are 18 are not have, going to have any idea what the character is talking about. Same thing in this book. In, in, one, in one trivial, it's a trivial example, because most of these are trivial. But in, in one trivial example, Omar is driving down a road, and he notices that the, the mall shops all look the same, like they're on a constant reloop. And the author allows Omar to think, just like it was in the old Flintstones cartoon. <laughs> when nine-tenths of the, the potential readership for this book is not only not going to know what that means, what it means, I'll help you here, is that the old Hanna-Barbera cartoon would often recycle the background cells as the, the characters were driving along the road. They didn't do it to make a point. You had to watch a lot of Flintstones cartoons or you would never notice that. But they did do it. Uh, but it's not only that. It's also that the the, the 18-year-olds who read this book are going to say, what the hell are the Flintstones? <laughs> it's, it's stuff like that. It happens a few times throughout the book, uh, steadily throughout the book. 
in a, not in ways that will distract or annoy you, but that I'm, I'm a reviewer, so of course I notice them. And the book would have been stronger without them. The book would have been, the whole of the book, of Operation uh, Orphans of Liberty, would have been better if the author had taken a flensing knife to it when the, when the final draft was done. Okay, here's the final draft. I am very pleased. This is smooth, professional work. And that is absolutely true. Now, I'm going to rip chunks out of it. <laughs> I think the book would have been better served by that. But the thing that amazed me about it, and the thing that I want to end with here, is that even with those first-time novelist foibles, and they are small, believe me, they will not distract you in the reading of this book. The reading of the book is terrific. Uh, even, if, even those being in this book, the thing that impressed me is how relatively small that is in terms of the total package of what you get with Orphans of Liberty. If this is the author's debut novel, I can't help but think that he's going to have a multi-book career at a big publisher shortly. And I, I, that's another thing I mentioned about the, uh, the process that we have here, is that I don't know even how to make that happen. I, major publishers have been absolutely stripped to the bones in terms of personnel and budget. Once upon a time, they had people who, on the staff whose job it was to look for talent like this, whether it was in literary journals or in small press stuff or whatever, uh, and maybe bring them on board and neuter them along to the point where they have where they're a hardcover author. I don't know that that system exists anymore. So books like this, I mean, God love the author for trying for for deciding I am going to do this, whether the system's ready for me or not. And you know, God love him for making such a quality thing. This is a this is an action thriller, a, you know, a slightly futuristic action thriller that you will really enjoy. If that's your kind of thing, you will not stop reading. I didn't. Uh, it's just I don't know I don't know where this author goes from here. I hope to many more books. I will certainly <laughs> I will certainly remember him. <laughs> I have briefly forgot that we did have an email exchange where he asked me, "Can I send you my book?" And as I mentioned yesterday, my answer to that question is always yes, provided we know that we understand some basic ground rules. One of which is, I'm under no obligation whatsoever to notice or review your book, and. Second of which, coming right on the heels of that, is that I'm also not under any obligation to soft pedal my criticism of your book. If I hate it, I probably wouldn't waste your time talking about a piece of garbage, uh, but I, I could. Uh, there's no, there's no, no sponsorship at all here, no partnership of any kind. I don't know this author. Uh, I, I agreed under those conditions, and so did he, because he clearly is a professional. You can tell from this book. Uh, but I don't know what... <laughs> I will, I, on, at one point at the end of the book, the author mentions what a lot of these self-published authors do. They say, you know, if you really want to help this book, leave, an, leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads or both or wherever. And I will certainly do that. I don't know what more I can do than that, except maybe talk to you. Uh, so if what I described pleases you, intrigues you, go ahead. I'm telling you, the execution of the book will also please you. The thing you would worry about when you read, like, the back cover copy or you hear a brief description of the book is that it's going to browbeat you with Trump and anti-Trump, and that is not the case. This author is not that lazy. He doesn't go for the low-hanging fruit of today's headlines. Instead, he talks, the book is based on general trends, trends that we've all seen. We have been losing our privacy. We have been showing a, a, a worrying trend in America to curtail our personal liberties for personal safety. And all the author does is extend that into the future and then create a niche where his hero can fight for his life and and eventually prevail <laughs> so i want to recommend this this is a recommend actually they both are uh the other one was this magilla this liverite new annotated memoirs of ulysses s grant great big thing edited by elizabeth samet who also does an editor's introduction and an, an editor's ending she, she she is all over this book in terms of uh, supporting prose and uh, I mentioned yesterday that in addition to being lovely illustrated, just it's lovingly illustrated, the annotations are along the bottom. They are footnotes along the bottom of every page. And uh, I also mentioned yesterday that Grant's memoirs have never really done much for me, and they don't. Unfortunately, this reading didn't, didn't change that. I, I do agree that there's a kind of grand reserved style going on, and it is, it is maintained throughout the whole book. I, 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 but I guess I've always noticed that. This book has been reprinted so many times. Penguin Classic has done one. Live for America did one. They did one in a box set with the memoirs of Sherman. Uh, and it's had many, many paperbacks, many, many editions. And uh, this is the one I'm going to keep. 
this was this is a tremendous tremendous performance. The this this editor writes with tremendous feeling and just encyclopedic knowledge of Grant and his times, Grant and his campaigns, Grant and his world. And one of the things that I always worry about, especially in annotations of beloved classics like this, this book is oddly beloved. <laughs> the people who love it, and there are lots of people who do, consider it to be the greatest thing since sliced cheese. And I, the thing I worry about in, anthology, in annotated editions of books like that, or, you know, Little Women or uh, Christmas Carol, uh, <laughs> what Grant would have thought to hear himself put it. <laughs> anyway, the thing I worry about is that that will that will filter through into the, the scholarly material, and it doesn't. It doesn't. Instead, Elizabeth Samet, all throughout her footnotes, is keeping watch on Grant as much as she is filling in his blanks. Excuse me. Uh, if Grant is, is blithe or ignorant about something, then sure enough, right there in the footnote, you will be told that's a little blithe and ignorant, and then you will be told the subject, the whole of the subject. Uh, I loved it from beginning to end, I, I can just imagine how over the moon I would be with an annotated version like this of an American classic that I really loved. <laughs> if it can make me feel this way about an, an odd American classic that I have never quite loved, can you imagine what I would be doing if I had in my hand the Liverite annotated edition of The Education of Henry Adams <laughs> at this same length, with this same brilliance? Oh my God, I would be insufferable for days. <laughs> uh, this, but even so, even with a book that I'm not particularly in love with, this is the volume that I'm going to keep. It's just barely under the size that is usable. If it were any bigger than this, any heavier than this, I probably wouldn't keep it because I wouldn't think I would ever use it. And I might uh, really snap up the paperback when uh, I think the paperback is inevitable down the line. I might do that, but even so, if you are feeling self-indulgent, <laughs> this book giving, this holiday season, or you're feeling generous to someone you know who's a Civil War buff, military history buff, that sort of thing, uh, don't miss this. Because <laughs> this it's not just Grant's memoirs. <clears throat> it's Elizabeth Salmon on every page just being a wonderful, spirited guide. She knows everything. She quotes from everything. She, far, far more, in my opinion, her notes are far more far-reaching than the other annotated memoirs of Grant that we saw on this channel. Uh, this is, and also, this is hands down prettier. This is just a gorgeous volume. It's full of illustrations, and and uh, the editor is right there from beginning to end, just, just as, as a steady, non non obtrusive presence to help you with all of the things that an annotator should do, but not with all the stuff that an annotator shouldn't do. So this annotator will tell you all about the precise political details behind the military maneuvers in the Mexican-American War, stuff that never crossed Grant's mind to elaborate on, because as far as he knew, everybody in his audience already knew them. She will tell you that, but she won't make a separate annotation to describe to you what a horse is. <laughs> Some annotators just lose their way. They start annotating everything inside. <laughs> and this, author, this author doesn't do that. Uh, so this is also a recommendation. This is going to be a big, ornate thing. It's probably in bookstores already. Does this have a pub sheet? I don't remember if this has a pub sheet. I think either one of them have a pub sheet. But this will probably be in your bookstores. It'll probably be stacked if it, here in America at Barnes & Noble. Uh, it'll probably be stacked at front gift tables or whatever because it's a big $35 hardcover that, you know, an American classic and is eye-catching. And uh, I hope that it is. I hope it finds a wide readership because it's a magnificent performance. Uh, so there you go. That is, This is a follow-up video of the two books that I got yesterday, both of which I strongly recommend, even though they're, they're wildly different. This is established Americana. This is a book that Gore Vidal and a whole bunch of other people have, in my opinion, grotesquely overpraised. But I see a lot of its reading merits more now than I used to. Uh, especially with the help of, you know, back-to-back -back annotated editions, and especially with the help of this one, which has at maps and pictures and uh, patient, uh, positive but not adulatory notes throughout. Uh, so uh, it's a strong recommendation, and so is this one. Orphans of Liberty is also a strong recommendation. This is It, it's, it is a, a really well-turned-out action-adventure novel set in the near future. So you've got... A, a typical, really capable action-adventure hero with a conflicted background and all sorts of personal issues, 
But you also have also to think about, to have fun with throughout, you have uh, some sociopolitical extrapolations that will make you think. They will they are interesting because the author is not heavy handed about it. Uh, so in terms of yesterday's mail hall and today's follow up report, it doesn't get much better than this. These are two books that I really liked and both recommend. <laughs> so, so, uh, unfortunately, well, maybe I don't know if it's unfortunate. We'll see. Unfortunately, in the case of Orphans of Liberty, it's not the same. A Liverite hardcover is going to be everywhere. This, you're going to have to go and buy. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to see it in a bookstore. It's the trade-off that self-published people get. They get complete control over what they're doing, and the price is distribution. Uh, so I will leave a link to both of these, uh, just in case you're interested. I don't, I'm not a booktuber who has any kind of book depository or affiliate link or anything like that. Uh, so I will just leave, I will leave links for you to be able to click, and just to make it easy for you. I'll leave links to make it easy for you to click and find these things, just so you can see the details. But in both cases, they are strong recommendations. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up for now. I don't know if I'll, if I'll continue to do this, this, these morning after reports. This was kind of fun. Uh, but one way or another, we have plenty of other bookish stuff to talk about. Uh, so I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.